Good morning, everybody. How are we this morning? Everybody good? Morning, Tom. A couple real quick announcements. Um, Promise Land Quartet has asked several of the churches to announce this. It's a last-minute engagement with um, Mark Trammell Quartet. Those of you who like Southern Gospel music are familiar with them. They will be at the Front Royal Church of the Brethren this coming Friday night at 7 o'clock. So if you like Southern Gospel music, you probably want to be there. Just, just want to give that quick update. Uh, for us, as far as First Christian Church goes, uh, this week will be our family promise meal on Wednesday, our regular uh, life meal. Did you want to speak anything to that, Lori? Okay, thank you. Uh, the church picnic will be next Sunday, uh, starting at, I think you arrive there at 3 o'clock. Plan to eat at 5, Kathy, is that right? Okay. Uh, hamburgers, hot dogs, paper products will be provided. Just bring a side dish, things like that with you. Lawn chairs, fishing poles, uh, bathing suits, all those kind of things. Apple butter will be October 4th and 5th. We'll start about noon on October 4th to Friday and go all night until we're done on Saturday. And remember the Joseph Habedank concert on October the 11th. That's a Friday night at 7. Uh, you will need a ticket. Tickets are free, but you will need a ticket. You can get those through the church website. There's also some flyers out in the foyer if you want to take some and put them up in the local stores, convenience stores, things like that. And I think that's all we have for announcements, so let's prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the opportunity we have together as like-minded believers together in your house to give you the worship and praise that you alone are due. Lord, quiet our hearts, still our minds, and open our ears that we would be attentive to, to give you the praise this morning. In all things, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand in worship this morning.
2 Thessalonians 3 verse 5 says, May the Lord direct your hearts in God's love and Christ's perseverance. And Jeremiah 24 verse 7, I will give them a heart to know me, for I am the Lord, and they will be my people, and I will be their God, for they will return to me with their whole heart. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. You are the poor. better and better for as you know him better he will give you through his great power everything you need for a living a true good life he even shares his own glory and his own goodness with us second peter verse 23 
Hey, good morning. Anybody else been enjoying the weather this past week? You know, I feel like you just sweat your way through August, right? I mean, it just seems like the air is so thick, and you can't get enough sweet tea to quench your thirst, and those mosquitoes, they just seem like they outnumber everybody around you, right? But then it happened, you know. I was taking the boys' backpacks to the car this week to get ready for school, and you push the button, and the garage door goes up, and that cool breeze just hits you, right? You know, it uh, tells you fall's coming. You know, there's a crispness in that breeze that, you know, kind of reinvigorates you from the heat of the summer and lets you know that that new season's coming. But, you know, our, in our lives, we go through those seasons too, right? Just like the calendar. You know, sometimes we feel really weighed down by situations in our lives. And in those times, that's when you take it to God, right? But you can't forget to acknowledge those times in your life when you feel that renewing breeze that comes from Jesus too. So I guess at this point, I want to ask you guys, are there any of those concerns weighing you down or any of those moments where you felt that breeze of Jesus blowing through? And we like to share this morning. Yeah, David. back home. Anybody else have anything? Yes, ma'am, Patsy. share with us this morning. Always always a good time out at the farm. Um, I would remind you too, if you don't want to stand up on a Sunday morning and share, um, I understand that. We do have prayer cards that are in a basket located just out in the foyer there that you can write it down and we'll make sure that we bring those to the congregation's attention too. All right, if there's nothing else, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, please. Lord, we praise you because you know all things, see all things, and remember us. Thank you that we can depend on your presence with us in every season and situation, that each time has purpose and meaning. We're grateful that each season is orchestrated by you, even the harder ones. And help us to see your hand and guidance in our lives as we go through changes, both the highs and the lows. May we grow in trust and persevere in the valleys, and how great you are, O God, for being so intentional to care for us in every season. For even when things seem glum, your light continues to shine on us in mercy and in grace. And it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. All right, could I have a few of my favorite people come up to help me with the offering, please?
Dear God, thank you for this beautiful day. We are all very blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. clay mold me and make me after that will I mean that's how he started off with us anyway from forming us from the dust of the ground everything else he spoke into existence but when it came to man God got in dirt and he formed us just as he would have us to be and then we messed it up like we always do Satan said don't do this and we said okay we will or I'm sorry God said don't do this Satan said it'd be all right you can do that, and we do. But we have this opportunity each week to come before God and examine ourselves and let him mold us and make us again after his will. 
So examine your hearts this morning as we prepare to observe the Lord's Supper together. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took bread, he broke it, and he gave thanks. Father in heaven, we're so thankful 
for these emblems which represent the broken body and shed blood of your son and our savior we thank you for the for his willingness to go to the cross saying nevertheless lord let thy will be done we thank you for each stripe we thank you for each drop of blood for, that was shed on our behalf in jesus name he took the bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat from this, all of you. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup and he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, freely poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. I want to give you another just real brief quick update on the situation in India the I'll make sure I get my wording right here the, the judicial process in India has pretty much released all of the Central India Christian Mission people from their um, what's the word I'm looking for Matt help me out <laughs> Okay, yeah, bonded. Uh, the things that they've been charged with, I'll, I'll put it that way. And they have also gone back to the government officials who brought the charges against them and said, we need more evidence. You all need to prove why you all have done the things that you've done. So still a long ways to go, I'm sure, but progress is being made. Prayers are being answered and keep praying. Things are going well there, as well as can be anyway. Um, also, I've not intentionally, but one of the things I need to ask for for prayers, um, I, I wasn't in this area during the prayer time. I, I'd like to ask you to pray for my dad. He's um, He's been diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension. He's not getting good blood flow from his heart to, to his lungs. Um, dad hasn't preached in six weeks. He hasn't been to church in three weeks. He has difficulty walking from here to the front door. Um, so just just ask you to pray for dad and pray for the situation in Galilee also. Um, you know, they're going to need to be looking for a new minister, obviously. So just, just keep that situation in your prayers as well. This morning we're going to be in uh, Mark chapter 4. We'll be doing uh, verses 1 through 20 this morning. A parable that's familiar to most of us, the parable of the scattering seed. Mark writes, once again, Jesus began teaching by the lake shore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. He taught them by telling many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scattered it across the field, some of the seed fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants, so they produced no grain. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Then he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Later, when Jesus was alone with the twelve disciples and with the others who were gathered around, they asked him what the parables meant. He replied, You are permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom of God, but I use parables for everything I say to outsiders so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they see what I do, they will learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven." Then Jesus said to them, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message. 
only to have Satan come at once and take it away. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things, so no fruit is produced. And the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. Let's pray. Father in heaven, let us not take the, the familiar words this morning and just gloss over them as something that we've already heard before. Lord, we know that your mercies are new each morning, and I pray that your words would fall on us this morning and, and spur us on to what you have called us to do and what you're calling for us in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. There was a man who was having serious heart trouble, so he went to the doctor to see what his options were. His doctor re recommended that he have a heart transplant. So the patient asked if there were any hearts immediately available and told the doctor that he could pay whatever amount was necessary for the transplant. The doctor replied, well, there are three hearts that are available for you to choose from. The first is from an 18-year-old kid, non-smoker, very athletic. He was a swimmer who hit his head on the diving board and died. The price is $100,000. The second heart is from a marathon runner, 24 years old, in great condition, but he was hit by a bus and died. That price is $150,000. The third heart is from a heavy drinker, chain smoker, and a red meat lover. The price for that heart is $500,000. The patient asks, hey, why is that heart so expensive since it seems like the man didn't have a very healthy lifestyle? The doctor replied, well, the price is so high because it's never been used. It's from a lawyer. <laughs> we don't have any lawyers in here this morning, do we? <laughs> I hope not anyway. <laughs> but let me ask you a question. Does your heart get used very much? What's the condition of your heart? Now, the heart I'm asking about today is not your physical heart, but your spiritual heart. Somewhere within each one of us is a spiritual heart that's the center of our beings. Our spiritual heart controls our wills and our desires, our motives and our actions. Someone has said when God measures a person, he puts the tape around their heart, not around their head. But unfortunately, just as the physical heart can suffer from disease, so can the spiritual heart. And our spiritual heart disease is much more serious and much more deadly than physical heart disease. I cannot emphasize enough how important our spiritual hearts are. Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, guard your heart above all else. It determines the course of your life. So today, as we move into Mark chapter 4, we enter into one of only two chapters in Mark that focus on Jesus' teaching. There's chapters 4 and chapter 13. Last week in chapter 3, we saw that some people around Jesus had some heart problems. Jesus' own family had concerns and doubts about Jesus. And the religious leaders had decided that Jesus' power had come from the devil himself. I believe that Jesus taught this parable and then explained it to his disciples because so much of what their mission would entail had to do with sowing the word of God and trying to deal with people's different kinds of hearts. Mark begins, once again, Jesus began teaching by the lake shore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. He taught them by telling many stories in the form of parables. Now we notice that Jesus was again teaching a large crowd by the sea. And in order to protect himself and to aid with the projection of his voice, Jesus got into a boat and pushed out a little bit from the shore. Then he sat down and he taught from the boat. Jesus' teaching consisted of many parables as we see through all the Gospels. Now a parable is a story about a real life situation from which a spiritual truth can be drawn. It's a comparison, an illustration, an analogy. And the word parable literally means to throw alongside. When you throw alongside something, you're parallel to it. So in a parable, something abstract concerning spiritual things is thrown beside something concrete concerning earthly things so that we can understand the spiritual things. 
Parables are not allegories that require every detail to be interpreted. Parables teach a primary principle and teaches its applications. And we'll touch on why Jesus taught in parables when we get into verses 10 and 12 in a few minutes. But Mark recorded this parable of Jesus in verses 3 through 9. Jesus says, listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed, and as he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants, so they produced no grain. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Then he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Did you notice that Jesus bookended the parable with the command to listen? The kind of listening that Jesus commanded here goes well beyond hearing with the ear or something going in one ear and out the other. Real hearing of Jesus' teachings goes all the way into our hearts and it brings about conviction and transformation. Jesus' parable drew upon an agricultural image that everyone listening that day would have been familiar with. They all could identify with a man with a bag of seed walking through his field, rhythmically scattering the seed. But as he spreads the seed, some falls on the pathway and the birds eat it up. Other seed lands on rocky ground where the seed quickly sprouts, but then it wilts because the soil is shallow. Other seeds fall among the thorns where the seed grows, but it's choked out and can't produce any fruit. And the final seed falls on the good soil and produces a large harvest. Whoever has ears, let them hear and contemplate the meaning. Jesus longed for his hearers to understand and be changed by his teachings. But he knew that not everyone would hear, understand, and then take it to heart. If you'd been in the audience that day and you had never heard this parable before or heard the explanation, what might you have thought about it? You might have thought, nice story, true to life. But I wonder what his point is. Did Jesus' disciples get the meaning of it? According to Mark, they didn't understand either. Later, when Jesus was alone with the 12 disciples and with the others who were gathered around, they asked him what the parable meant. He replied, you are permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom of God, but I use parables for everything I say to outsiders so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they see what I do, they will learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they will understand nothing. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? So Jesus spoke in parables for two reasons. First, it was to reveal kingdom truths, and second was to conceal kingdom truths. The only people that Jesus wanted to understand kingdom truths were those who really wanted to know and understand, and those who were willing to put in the effort to search and to contemplate the scriptures. J.B. Phillips explained it this way. In a sense, the gospel of God is an open secret, but in another sense, it remains a mystery. To those who are shallow or lazy or proud, in mind, the great truth of the Christian faith remains obscure and even nonsensical. Understanding the secrets of the kingdoms has to do with a person's openness. Those with hard hearts and closed ears and closed eyes will never understand and they won't obey. The explanation of why Jesus spoke in parables is abbreviated here in Mark, but it's explained more fully in Matthew 13. The quote that Jesus used in this section is from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, where Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would be speaking to people who were like a brick wall of resistance due to prejudices and misconceptions, and Jesus' parables wouldn't make any sense to them. So Jesus asked his disciples, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand all of the parables? The parable of the sower has been considered the father of all parables. And it sets the stage for properly interpreting the other parables of, Je of Jesus. We don't have Jesus' explanation of many of his parables. But this one is the parable he gave the most extensive, extensive ex explanation of. 
And as we'll see, even though this parable has been called the parable of the sower, it can more properly be called the parable of the soils. Because it's not so much about the sower as it is about the type of soil that the seed falls on. So let's examine Jesus' explanation of the parable. Jesus explained the farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. So what's the seed? The seed's the word of God. And who's the sower? The sower is anyone who teaches or preaches God's word or anyone who believes God's word. We're all called to be seed sowers. Now the four types of soil that the word falls on represent the kinds of hearts that people have. And since all of us have a heart that God is working on, we all are represented in this story. And as our lives continue, our hearts may go through different phases and conditions. So we need to constantly monitor the condition of our hearts. The first kind of soil is this trampled soil, which represents people with a hard heart. The farmer's fields in Jesus' day were often long and narrow, winding strips of land divided by paths which became hard as rocks from people walking on it. Now the soil may have been good soil, but it's been hardened by consistent tramping. The seeds that fell on these paths just bounced on the hard surface, and it sat there until the birds came and ate the seeds. When the word of God is sown to a person with a hard heart, it just sits there on the surface and doesn't penetrate or move them at all. What is it that makes a person's heart so hard? Now, there can be a number of causes. Sin in general causes a dullness or a hardness of heart. And the more a person sins, the harder their heart becomes. And for the unbeliever, that's the only way to deal with the guilty conscience. Self-satisfaction and pride can cause a hardness of heart when a person thinks, person thinks they don't need God or they think they know more than God. Bad religion that's abusive or ritualistic or rooted in tradition can lead to hard hearts. This is the most hopeless of all the heart conditions that Jesus described because the word of God isn't allowed to penetrate and make a difference. The person is oblivious to the fact that they're spiritually dead. This ground needs to be broken up, and God may use the plow of pain and suffering to try to open a person's heart. But even that doesn't work for many people with a hardened heart. Hardships can lead a person to God, or they can drive them further away, depending on the person's heart. So let's pray that we will not harden our hearts toward God, and let's pray for those who have a hardened heart that they'll soften their hearts to God. The second kind of soil is the rocky soil. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The rocky soil represents people with a shallow heart. In this illustration, the ground was not rocky because it was full of stones, but because there was a layer of rock underneath the thin layer of soil. In much of the land of Galilee, there's a thin layer of soil only an inch or two thick that covers a shelf of limestone rock. Sounds kind of familiar around here, doesn't it? When the seed fell on that kind of soil, it germinated and grew quickly, but then it withered and died in the sun's heat because the shallow soil held little moisture and nourishment. The person with a shallow heart hears the word. They receive it gladly, but they never put down deep roots in faith discipleship and relationships in God's family. Jesus said that when distress or persecution come because of the word, the person with a shallow heart immediately falls away. Now some people debate whether this person was actually a Christian or not, but Jesus indicates that the word actually took root and it began to grow, but then it withered and died. So the important thing for us is to make sure that we don't have that kind of a heart. One thing that will help us not have a shallow heart to be sure we understand God's promises and principles as we make a decision to follow Jesus. We must understand the denial of self and the picking up of the cross that's involved in discipleship. We need to understand that Jesus said that we would be hated and persecuted because people hated and persecuted him first. The promise of God for disciples of Jesus isn't rose gardens and health and wealth but rather he's promised us abundant life and eternal life 
that includes joy and peace, strength and endurance. The Apostle Paul reminded the Colossian Christians, and now just as you accept Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. We must continue with Jesus and remain in Jesus and abide with Jesus, just like the branch must be attached to the vine to stay healthy and alive. We must be rooted up and built up in Christ and continue to feed ourselves on the Word of God. We must continue to exercise our spiritual muscles through spiritual disciplines like worship, fellowship, service, prayer, Bible reading, and Bible study. We need the staying power that comes from putting down deep roots into Christ and His church. If we continue with a shallow heart, then we'll likely wither and fall away from Christ. Now, the third kind of soil is the thorny soil. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things so no fruit, fruit is produced. The thorny soil represents people with a crowded heart. Farmers in Jesus' day and in, and in our day clear the land of thorns and weeds before planting. The thorns and the weeds may be burned off or scraped off, are plowed under before planting, but their roots remain intact, and they sprout and grow quickly along with the good seed. The thorns and the weeds compete with the good seed for water and nourishment and keep the good seed from producing fruit. Jesus explained that the thorns represent the worries of life, the deceitfulness of money, the desire for other things. Few things are more hostile to the things of God than the love of riches and the pursuit of the pleasures of this world. That's why Jesus said it would be hard for the rich to be saved. James 4 verse 4 reminds us, Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. This is a picture of a believer who has a divided heart and a crowded life. They have mixed loyalties which strangle the spiritual life out of them. The word of God has taken root and grown, but their fruitfulness is hindered and limited. The person doesn't spiritually die or completely fall away, but they're not growing. They're not contributing to the growth and effectiveness of the church and of God's kingdom. There are so many things in our world and our lives that can choke out the world, the word. How sad it is that we often fill our lives with so many things that aren't necessarily bad or evil, but they divert our time and our attention away from spiritual things. There are so many things to watch on TV or on our phones. There are so many activities and events to participate in. There are so many hobbies to enjoy. And before we know it, these things have taken over our lives and choked out the things of the Lord. Like good gardeners, we need to regularly examine our heart and our lives. And we need to do some weeding. Part of the weeding process includes being reminded of our priority of seeking first the kingdom of God. We must ask ourselves if we're being a good soldier of God or if we're getting all wrapped up in civilian affairs. Are we spending too much time on entertainment and not enough time on spiritual education? Are we too focused on selfishness and not focused enough on service? Are we trying to serve God and money? Is our heart too divided, too infested, and too crowded? Now, the fourth and last kind of soil is the good soil. The seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as it had been planted. The good soil represents the healthy heart. Now, the good soil is the opposite of the three kinds of bad soil. The good soil is soft rather than hard. It's deep rather than shallow and is free of weeds rather than crowded out by them. The good soil produces an incredible crop, as much as a hundred times as what was planted. Jesus explained that those with a healthy heart do three things. First, they hear the word. They take time to listen and to study God's word. Second, they welcome the word. They accept the word and they believe it. And third, they obey the word and put it into practice. This leads to producing fruit. 
Don't you want to be the good soil with the healthy heart that produces a great harvest? I do. To be sure we continue to have a healthy heart, we must continually remove any rocks that keep us from putting down deep roots. We must regularly remove any weeds that are choking out our spiritual life. So let's conclude today's sermon with some action steps to put what God's Word says into practice. First of all, be a sower of the Word of God. Jesus implied that the seed cannot get to the soils without a sower, and that's true. There cannot be preaching without a preacher, there cannot be teaching without a teacher, and there cannot be a disciple without a discipler. All of us can plant the seed of God's Word in the lives of people around us. But as important as the sower is, it's not more important than the seed. Second, we need to trust in the power of God's Word. It's not the preacher or the teacher or the discipler who makes the disciple grow. It's God's work through God's Word that makes the difference. And I don't think I gave Kathy all the verses for this one, so just follow along with me. Paul reminded us of this truth when he wrote, After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We're only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted in your hearts, and Apollos watered it. But it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. And keep in mind what the Hebrew writer wrote, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. God's word exposes our spiritual heart. God's word has the power to convict and correct and produce fruit. This takes a lot of pressure off the sower. The power is in the seed. But as powerful as that seed is, it's the condition of the heart that determines the outcome. Third, we need to cultivate the right kind of heart. God has given each of us ownership of our own hearts And so we're the only ones who can make our hearts open and soft or deep and undivided. Nobody else can do it for us. And even God will not force us to change our hearts. Each of us has to prepare the soil of our heart. Each of us has to listen to the word and welcome it into our lives. Each of us has to constantly put the word of God into practice. And finally, examine your heart. Where do you find yourself in this parable today? What's the present condition of your heart? Are you the trampled soil which represents people with a hard heart? If you are, then I hope and pray that you'll open your heart to God today. Are you the rocky soil which represents people with a shallow heart? If that's you, then I pray that you'll break up that hard layer of rock and allow the roots of Christ to go down deep It's going to require some faith and effort in practicing the spiritual disciplines. Are you the thorny soil which represents people with a crowded heart? If you are, then I pray that you'll do the hard work of weeding out the worldly things that are choking out your spiritual life. Or are you the good soil which represents people with a healthy heart? I pray that you'll continue to work hard to remain good soil by keeping out the rocks and keeping out the weeds that make a person unfruitful. God made us, and he loves us, and he wants the best for each one of us. So we can trust that his seed will grow in us as we cooperate with God and as we abide in God. And this results in God's glory and our goodness and blessing. You've got to have heart. So let's make sure it's a good heart. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for, your, for the seed of your word. They get scattered in all places. And we just pray that we would cultivate soil in ourselves, that we would be receptive to your word, that we would have healthy hearts and good soil. But Lord, let us also not ignore those around us who maybe have a shallow heart or a hard heart or a crowded heart. Let us work with those folks to cultivate their hearts and the healthy hearts and good soil that will be receptive. Lord, we all go through each of those stages at different times in our lives. But let us always pursue 
to be good soil, to have a healthy heart, and to share the good news of your Son wherever we may go. Lord, let us not be concerned about results, but let us be faithful in sowing seeds, the seed of your Word, the seed of your Son, that those who hear and those who accept will confess Jesus as their Lord and Savior to make him the Lord of their life, to be baptized by submission to the waters of baptism. And Lord, let us be faithful until you call us home. We give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. time that we can gather to give you praise and glory. Thank you for each one gathered here this morning and I pray that as we go through this week that we will be faithful to what you called us to be, sowers of your seed, that we would be brave in our witness, bold in our witness, but with grace and truth as well as we share your son with those we come in contact with this week. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 